We come now to our scripture lesson today, which is found in uh, 2 Samuel, 2 Sam- Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 to 11, and then verse 16. And you're welcome to um, follow along in your pew Bible, uh, Bible at home, or read here on the screen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this, your word, which you have freely and wonderfully give, given to us. We ask you that our hearts are open to, to hear your word in, in that way that you want, want us to, to hear it, whether it be uh, to encourage, uh, to hold accountable, to, to teach, to plant seeds, whatever it might be, Lord, we pray that we receive it through your Holy Spirit and we're able to draw closer to you because of it. We also ask for your mercy this day on the sermon, that it too might be used for your glory and yours yours alone. We thank you for your wonderful love, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 to 11, and verse 16. Hear now God's word. After the king was settled in his palace, King David was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan, the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David that this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with the tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell tell my servant David, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our scripture today, uh, as you have plainly heard, is not the typical Christmas Eve scripture that you're all used, used, used to. It's not the um, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20, you know, Caesar, Augustus, Cre- uh, 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 baby Jesus riding on a donkey, you know, all that. It's not that. Because it's not Christmas Eve, this is the fourth Sunday in Advent. Christmas Eve is tonight, and you'll get that tonight. But today we're finishing the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the fourth Sunday of Advent is the last Sunday of preparation. We're still preparing our hearts to receive Jesus for, for, for t- tomorrow. And part of that preparation is to be reminded that what Christ does, for, or what God does for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, wasn't just a, I'm bored, I want to do something new kind, kind, kind of thing. That God had this plan for a very long time. Now, the question always comes to me is, why did God pick the time that God picked in order to send Jesus? Why during that time? Why not during this time? I mean, the amount of, uh, the amount of, of times that people Instagram and, and Facebook and, uh, and tweet, X, whatever you want to call it. The amount of times people do that this time, uh, God wouldn't have to send angels in the sky to shepherds. God just could send people with cell phones to the manger, and then everyone would know at the same, same time. But for some reason, God picked that time. Now, and I've always thought 
as a, as a pastor that God picked that time because for whatever reason, God decided that that was the perfect time. But then I read a poem in preparation for our service tonight that, that asked that same question, why did God pick that time? And their answer, well, not their answer, but their, in their question was, why did God pick that time? Because that wasn't a perfect time. Because there was war, there was hatred with one another, there was rivalry, there was a lust for, for, for power. There were uh, people who didn't want to see the Messiah come, but people who wanted to hold on to their own, own, own power. Pow, pow, power. Why that time? Because the people fought and, and killed one another after, uh, after Herod found out that uh, Herod, yeah, after Herod found out that Jesus was born, he killed all the children in, in, in Bethlehem. Why that time? And it's true, when you look back at that time, that time wasn't perfect. It was a mess. The people didn't understand. There was a lot of hatred going on. Love was in short, short, short supply, depending on where, 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 where you, you looked. But then again, you look at today's, and I can say the exact same thing. Our world is a mess. People are fighting. Love is in, in short, 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 short supply. Uh, people love to knock e e e e e each other down, down, down a uh, peg. Um, this world's not so great uh, either this time. You know, um, I, I, I love the old sayings, and I use the old sayings a lot because I lack originality. But, but why build on something that, that they already said so well? The more things change, the more they say the same. Sure, there's a lot of superficial things that look very different from back in Jesus' day, um, but we're the same people. We're backbiting one another. We got a lust for power. So that time is not much different than this time. And God chose that time. But because God chose that time, the number of lives that were changed up to the point where we are today is enormous. That for God, that was the perfect time. And when I look at, at God and how God works all throughout the, the Bible, um, Peter, in the book of Romans, I think it is, says it beautifully. God, God's foolishness is greater than God's wisdom, and God's weakness is greater than... Or, I'm sorry, God's foolishness is greater than man's wisdom, and God's weakness is greater than man's strength. That God uses the unbelievable to do so very much. But that was just part of what the scripture about. The first part does fall into this um, a bit more. David's asking Nathan to give him permission to make God a, a, a temp, temp, temple. God's been traveling around for generations, for decades, in a, in a tent. After they came out of Egypt, they made a tent for, for God's presence. And whenever they stopped, they uh, put the tent upright and the... The Spirit of God will come down in the form of a cloud and sit on that spot, and they knew that this was God's presence. And in that day and age, a temple to a God showed the God's presence in that temp, temp, temp temple. But God never asked for anything more. And in fact, the tabernacle was a beautiful sign that wherever the people went, God was there too. When you have a temple in one place and you wanted to go visit that God, you went to that temp, temp temple. But with the tabernacle, they didn't have to go to God. God went with them. And now that David is feeling all good, and he's got his beautiful house, his great palace, and now he's thinking about God. In, in, their, in, God's, in David's prosperity, he thought of God. Now in the world that we live in, oft, more often than not, we think of God when things go bad. Lord, help me. Lord, do this for me. Lord, I need this. I need that. And when things are going great, God, I got it. Things are wonderful. We're good now. David, in his prosperity, thought of, of uh, God and said, Lord, you need a house too. Now God said to David, I don't need one, but if you want me to build one, 
I appreciate the thought. I'm going to have your son build it for, 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 for me. And so Solomon did. Solomon built a most beautiful temple for God, and it looks like that it is a lot bigger than that. It was huge, enormous, it was opulent, it was, uh, part of it was gold, and it was gorgeous. A gorgeous temple fit for the own, 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 only God. But uh, this temple does not exist anymore. Um, it got destroyed, and a new temple was built in its place, and that temple got destroyed in about 70 A.D., and only one part of that temple is left, which is called the Wailing Wall. If you ever hear the Wailing Wall, uh, that's the last standing piece of, of the uh, temp temple. Not Solomon's temple, but another one later. Um, but the neat thing, the thing that I always loved, and the answer is already here, is that when God decided to come down on earth and dwell, it wasn't in a temple, it was in a child. God's first temple and dwelling place for his son, Jesus Christ, was nothing more than wood and hay. Nothing more than, than being surrounded by animals and the smell of dung and, and the sound of rain. And this was Christ's first temple. The thing that I love about Christmas is what we celebrate is a God who had everything with the word created, with the word um, ordered chaos. Could come down on earth and be whomever, whomever he wanted and chose to be one, the God who wanted for nothing, needed for nothing, became a baby who needed for everything. Couldn't survive on his own and needed Mary to watch over him. This God, who was everything, came on earth and started as nothing. And that child, like any other child, that child changed the world. And even as a baby, affected the lives of so many. Before he was the age of two, he was worshipped as a king. God had this in plan all along. And we celebrate this today. And tonight, when we gather together, we'll put Jesus there in the main manger. We'll sing happy birthday. And we'll thank God that his son was born for us. That we may know salvation that we may know love, peace, joy, and hope. And I thank, 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 thank God for that. Sorry. <clears throat> I share with you this final benediction. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, amen. Go in peace and Merry Christmas.